Well, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Crucial Conversations. I'm Peter. I'm Kevin. And we are doing something new today. We're going to start a new series, aren't we, Kevin? We are. <laughs> you can't just you can't just give me a thumbs up. You actually have to talk into the microphone. <laughs> this is the non-video portion of the project. Yes, yes. Uh, actually, none of this is video recorded, which would be good in most cases but so here's what we're doing today we are actually going to start an intentional series as opposed to the accidental series that we've done previously where it's like oh let's do another episode on that that kind of worked out well we're actually going to do this on purpose christology christology 101 Uh, first of all we should probably define what christology is so we'll do that today and we're going to talk about why why are we doing this why are we Talking about Christology, why are we going to dedicate an entire series to Christology? Uh, especially because we could end up doing this for the next year. Uh, it is such a far-reaching, broad, all-encompassing topic. We could subject. do this for all of eternity. Well, there is that too. I was I was going to throw out a year, but if you want to say eternity, I guess we could do that too. <laughs> all of eternity. All of eternity. So, okay, Kevin, we should probably start with with the basics let's start with defining what christology is first i'm gonna let you do that well christology is is simply words about christ um that's what the christology means christ obviously christology is starts with christ and then ology is words so it's it's words about christ or the study of how we talk about the person and work of jesus christ as it is confessed by the church and the way the church confesses it is because that is the way that it is taught to us in Holy Scripture. So one of the things that we have been very intentional about on this podcast and Crucial Productions in general is this idea of seeing everything through the lens of Christ, uh, through the lens of Jesus. We have a couple episodes titled the lens of Jesus. We have a Bible reading plan through the lens of Jesus. And so in a way, this this isn't entirely out of character for us to do this on purpose. <laughs> no, hopefully this is what we've been doing the whole time. Right. I think the difference is we're actually going to attempt to be more structured and more thorough and actually go a lot deeper. So I will actually be doing more reading and research. You've already been doing reading and research. We actually want feedback from you guys who are listening. We would love to have your questions, the things you want answered, to also be included in this to help guide where we go in the various episodes as we get into this series. So I'm I'm going to say right off the bat, if you have questions about Jesus, send them to us. And yes, that is extremely broad. Send them to us where? Questions at crucialproductions.org is the email address. Or you can go to our website, crucialproductions.org, and at the top there's a Ask a Question link. Click that, fill out the form, and that will get the question to us that way as well. Or on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, we're on all of those platforms. You can send us questions there. Uh, Just look for Crucial Productions, and you'll see our CP logo that identifies whether it's actually us or not, because there's one or two other Crucial Productions, but they're definitely not Christologically focused, so we we should be a little bit easier to identify as the the right one or the correct one. And let's be honest, no one's trying to be us, right? Yeah, that no nobody's trying to copycat us. We don't have that problem. Uh, they just there were a couple groups that had that name already, like in Namibia and the UK. <laughs> but the main point being, everything is fair game in this. There there is no question about Christ and our understanding of Jesus that is that is out of bounds in the sense that if you want to go really, really deep, we will take that question. If you have Greek and Latin terms that you want to use as you're talking about it, feel free to do that. If you have very simple, basic questions, we want to take those as well. Um, what will be funny is if somebody sends in what they think is a complicated question and we're like, that's very simple and basic. And the next person sends in what they think is simple and basic, and we're like, oh, that's actually really deep and complicated. The point being, 
all questions are good. <laughs> well, and and in Christology, all questions are both simple and and complex. Right. That that's what we're going to end up learning in this. Yeah. So it's just just ask. Yeah. <laughs> and and we won't even decide which ones are hard or simple because um, any question that helps us talk about Jesus and help people better um, enter into the discussion of who Jesus is and what he's done for us according to the Holy Scriptures is that's the goal. So yeah. we'll do it. If, if you run in uh, Lutheran circles online, one of the phrases you may have heard is, all theology is Christology. So we're going to put that to the test, aren't we, Kevin? Yeah, well, I, that's, yeah. I think we already agree with it. Yeah, we kind of we, already. We're like, yeah, that that's true. But we're actually going to, going to demonstrate how all, all of the theology that we do, what we talk about, we've already said Scripture is all about Christ mm-hmm. in multiple times in multiple ways. This, this series is really laying all that out even more so than we have before. I had another thought that has now escaped my mind. It'll come it back happens. to me in a minute. So... I was on Wikipedia. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that, ever. Because my, my thought was, okay, if somebody doesn't know what Christology is, wh- if, if that's a new word to them, they're unfamiliar with the term, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to do a Google search for it. What's the first thing that's going to pop up when they do a Google search? Probably Amazon. Amazon or Wikipedia. Yeah. In, in my case... There were a couple of things that came up earlier because I think I've searched on this before. But if somebody who, so there's contextual results, but somebody who hasn't searched on this, who hasn't done any study on this, just types into their favorite search engine, it's pretty good chances that Wikipedia is, is what's going to pop up. So let I'm going to read the definition there and we're going to discuss, okay, is this a helpful definition? And is this a problematic? Can you trust Wikipedia? No. <laughs> No, no, Kevin, we have to read the definition first before you answer that question. All right, Christology from Greek. Is that Christos? Mm-hmm. Oh, it is. And then it gives you a anglicized alphabet version. And logia, literally the understanding of Christ, is the study of the nature, person, and work, role in salvation, of Jesus Christ. It studies Jesus Christ's humanity and divinity and the relation between those two aspects and the role he plays in salvation. There you go. Okay. So we started a conversation about this, Kevin. We didn't finish it. I actually want to restart that conversation because I my immediate thought on this was, uh-oh, there are problems here. But you had another way of looking at it. So here's here's my problem. I immediately went to the the word aspects. And I saw that and I was like, okay, that's not how we usually talk about it. We usually talk about it as the two natures mm-hmm. in Christ, not aspects. And so my first right. thought was, okay, is aspects taking us in the wrong direction? Are we going to end up in some sort of Christological heresy? Because that's a different word and I don't think it means the same thing that nature means. And then I went and said, okay, well, there's a footnote there. Who is it that this footnote is from and that where they're getting this definition. And I saw that it was Bart Ehrman, who is a theologian, a scholar out in North Carolina. Is he still in North Carolina? Yep. Chapel Hill, University of North Carolina. Um, But very well known for, I don't know, deconstructing Christianity. Is that a way of Um, putting it? I don't know if he would be deconstructing Christianity. He He likes to question everything. Well, he... he, (laughs) We'll talk about deconstructing again some other time. Yeah. Um, but Bart Ehrman, quite simply, and, and to his own admission, fell away from the faith. Mm-hmm. And so um, the doubts that caused him to lose his faith is something that he thinks uh, highlight some things that the church has hidden for centuries. And so his mission in life is to make people question what the church is teaching them about the, the Bible, about God, and about the history of Christianity. So he's not necessarily deconstructing Christianity. He, he knows Christianity is what it is. He's, his mission in life is, is more to call into question um, the scriptures as a reliable text. And more than that, his goal is to advocate for theologies or even religions that were smashed by the 
what he would call the winners in the Christological or Orthodox debates. So he would say there are other Christianities that got smashed in there somewhere, and we should give them equal weight. Not let's just let's give them a try again. Yeah, let's get them a try. Yeah. So he he uh, he's a very smart fellow, uh, meaning he he knows his stuff. He is intelligent. He's yes. very intelligent, and he knows his stuff. Um, I'm not saying all of his books are accepted by scholars because his presuppositions lead him in places that other scholars kind of wonder how he got there. <laughs> but um, but he is respected in the New Testament scholarship world for um, knowing the New Testament, knowing his Greek, um, knowing textual criticism mm-hmm. well. However, his popular books are not to be trusted. Mm. Um, he, he definitely uses hyperbole when he talks about the New Testament. And so he'll find one little thing and make it sound like the entire New Testament is to be questioned because of it. Sure. That's his shtick usually, is that, <laughs> hey, there's this one verse that has a spelling difference, therefore there's 4, 400,000 errors in the New Testament. Well, no, Art. We, we Even often you know en- that's not true. Yeah, we often encounter him on the History Channel as, yes. as the New Testament expert when, right. when they're wanting to... Um, debunk Christianity, or to present a a non mainline, yeah, you know whatever you want to call it, so, mainstream. So me knowing that about Airman and and where his background, where he comes from, being triggered by this word aspects, and then seeing oh it was probably came from Airman. I read this and I'm like, well, this whole definition is probably bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and and you were like, wait, hold on a minute. It's it's not that bad. Um, it's actually a very, very well written def- definition, um, especially when it says the study of the nature and work of Jesus Christ. That those mm. are very important words. Um, one that I would actually not always expect in a Wikipedia article because this is getting really to Christology as Lutherans do it, which is that this is not a study in philosophical understandings of the natures of Christ. But the reason we discuss the, the natures of Christ and the person of Christ and the deity of Christ and humanity of Christ is because of the work that he did for our salvation. Okay, that's an important distinction to make here that I think we often miss, especially because discussions on, say, the two natures in Christ very quickly simply become philosophical discussions right. about the two natures. I was trying to think of a different yeah, way to phrase well, that. It didn't really so, work. So we're, we were trying to avoid this a little bit, but we're going to have to do it. So when we say two natures, let's make sure everybody understands what we're, what we're saying. So the most important phrase or, or little, little thing you can have in your mind when you're talking about Christology is that there's one person with two natures. Mm-hmm. So there are two natures in the one person, Jesus Christ. And we covered this in the Athanasian Creed on our right. episodes there. So we're we're following the same. So go back and review same that if you haven't. Rubric there, yeah. Right, or or go back and read the Athanasian Creed, or some of you are even memorizing it. So so work on memorizing. Yeah, that's it. a thing now is it's memorizing cool. it. Um, but but again, the the church has confessed as good theology, as as correct understanding of New Testament scripture that the New Testament scriptures present to us one person, Jesus Christ. And in that one person, Jesus Christ, is two natures. Mm-hmm. Okay, and those natures are the divine nature and the human nature. So the entire discussion of Christology, from a theological point of view, is making sure that we are correctly confessing one person with two natures. You can't have two persons. That's right out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you can't have one nature. That's right out. Yep. You have to have one person with two natures, and those two natures cannot be confused or combined. One doesn't eliminate the other one. They can't be separated. Yeah. All, and this is where you get into the Christological discussions of the church, is when we talk about one person with two natures, how do we do that? What are the right words? What are the yeah. right phrases? What are the right conceptions? And that's why, as you were just saying, this discussion, as you can tell, just in the way I'm talking, can get very philosophical. Yeah. You, you get into literally definitions of words. And, and so people right now are thinking, wait, you guys are going to do this for a whole year? Oh, we could easily do this for a year. <laughs> but nobody actually wants to listen to that. I think that's the problem. Well, I, <laughs> Unless you're an academic. So that's the problem. Well, I this don't, is all it is. 
if all it is is debating terms. See, I would, I would minutia. actually say you could listen to this for a year if you're a Christian. Hmm. Because okay. this is this is really the most important aspect of what it means to be a Christian, is to talk about Christ, mm. to think about Christ, to believe on Christ. So, the the difficulty is to not make it an academic pursuit, and that's what we started this whole conversation about. Yeah. is that from a Lutheran point of view, and I would say from a Christian point of view, that. Um, the reason you discuss the one person and two natures of Jesus is because this is how he accomplished salvation. This is mm. how uh, God, in all of his infinite wisdom, worked out our salvation. Was this this person, Jesus Christ, who has two natures in him, so one person, two natures, is the one who accomplished salvation our eternal salvation. Which he is, is the one that we hope in. Which is why a Wikipedia article actually referencing right. his work and that all this has to do with salvation is pretty good. <laughs> yeah. That's why I was <laughs> like, wow. I was actually favorably impressed with it. Yeah. Because and, and here I'm getting I'm getting triggered by aspects. I'm right. like, I don't know what that means. And you're like, wait, hold on, hold on. There's actually some really good right. stuff There's here. There's some very good stuff. Which I here. think is a good as as we're talking about this, is that's a good point to bring up in an introductory episode on a series because we may go to some sources throughout this. We may yeah. interview some individuals because we want to bring other people onto the podcast as we're mm-hmm. talking. It's not just going to be me and Kevin. We could do that, but we don't really want to. We like other voices. Some of those voices might not be Lutheran voices mm-hmm. that we bring in. And so part of what we're trying to do in this series is also show... We don't have the monopoly on fully getting Jesus. There are others out here who also talk. And let's work together to discern what's right and what's good without being immediately triggered. Now I'm I'm talking without immediately being triggered by the source, which and, is what happened to me. <laughs> and the other thing we want to continue to discuss is that Lutherans, any Christian, any person, any being you don't do theology in a vacuum. So every time mm. you're discussing theology or or professing what you believe or confessing what you believe, you are bearing witness. And that witness can either draw people to Christ or push them away. And we want to make sure that even as we discuss something as philosophically important and theologically important as the, the person and nature of Christ, we do so always, again, pointing to the grace of God that the point of this discussion is salvation for sinners. Mm-hmm. This is an evangelical, which is a big fancy word for gospel, yeah. right? <laughs> this is a gospel pursuit. Um, and that's, what's, again, circling back to the goodness of the definition is, and this is something just to keep in mind as we do all of this, is that we discuss theology in order to proclaim the gospel. Right. Like, that is the goal, is yeah. to make sure that when we are bearing witness to Christ, when we are talking to our friends and our family about our our faith in Christ, that we are doing it according to the will of God, which means it's for the benefit of people who hear it. Mm-hmm. It's not to prove that we're smart or to prove that we're right. It is to accurately and truthfully speak the word of God to anybody that we're talking to in any circumstance. And, and whether it's in the conversation as we're having it or to prepare us for other conversations we'll have later from people who are going to ask questions. I mean, I already right. have these conversations with my kids. I know you have this with conversations with your kids as well, where the the kinds of things that we'll be talking about as we're studying this aren't just good in an academic setting. They actually matter for life. All theology is Christology. If all of our every all of our talk about God is actually talk about Christ, well then we should be seeking to do this well and to do it rightly and, well, rightly because we're pointing to a specific person, not just some random one-size-fits-all, but no, Jesus is a specific person with specific attributes and specific actions that he's done. And if I'm talking about him and ascribing other actions to him that he didn't do or attributes to him that aren't actually his, I might actually be talking about a different Jesus entirely. 
or obfuscating the gospel. I mean, obfuscating yeah. is a big word. Look it up. But it means to make something less clear or to make something unclear. So we don't want our witness to to confuse people as they trust in Christ, but we want them to point to the truth of Christ, which is mm-hmm. what you're saying. So a not a false Christ and not an untruth about the true Christ. Right. So in all we do, as we discuss Christology, and we're going to get out of here pretty soon, um, the goal really, as, we, as we're talking about that definition, is that these things, the person of Christ, the natures of Christ, the goal is salvation. So the work of Christ is never separate from the discussion of the person of Christ. Mm-hmm. And that's actually one of the aspects of Christology is right. talking about <laughs> how these natures cooperate in everything that Christ does yeah. to achieve our salvation. Um, and we're going to get there. That's a that's an important aspect of all of this. Yeah. Um, a little bit for an overview, just, just in case people are listening and kind of going, okay, guys, be quiet. I want to find out some good stuff. Um, <laughs> we're going to get to some Bible passages henceforth. But before we do that, just to list some things, the kind of the the magnus opum, the, the big work on this, right, is written by a dude named Marty Chemnitz, right? Marty? Marty. Really? The You're second going Marty. Marty. Uh, okay. Martin Chemnitz wrote this... It, it, it was it's a couple years old now, isn't it? <laughs> a it's little just, bit. Just a couple years. Four hundred and fifty. Yeah, something ish. like that. Um, so Martin Chemnitz is one of the guys who compiled the Book of Concord, right? He, yep. He was a whole thing together uh, with some of his buddies, but he wrote a gigantic, ridiculously thick and over the top work <laughs> called <laughs> "The Two Natures in Christ." Yeah. It's available from CPH. Um, I don't know if it's available online. Other than through CPH, I have I don't know I have either. I have it from CPH, yeah. so I've never looked otherwise. <laughs> um, but it is the definitive work for how Lutherans talk about the person and nature of Christ. Um, if you want to read that, please do. It is brutal. <laughs> I mean, it is just hard to get through. But uh, the good news is, several people have have read it and reviewed it online. So you can maybe find another podcast or something mm-hmm. that will walk you through that. That's fine. Um, there are a lot of people that that purport to do such things. Um, One of I my know, goals in this series is to actually read more of it. Yeah. I've read I've, little bits here and there. And but I've been like, reading through it again. That'd probably um, be a good source for me to, it's good to read through the other, on. the other source obviously is our, is our um, dogmatic textbook for our seminarians, which is Peeper. Mm-hmm. And that is also available from CPH volume two will be where you find uh, your Christology section. So, um, that's in there as well. Now, just a little a little review of that. Peeper and Chemnitz number the the genera differently, and if you don't know what that means, <laughs> we'll get that's there. That's okay. Yeah, but just in case you're reading them at the same time or comparing them, they do number them differently. So just be aware of that. It's okay. <laughs> the numbering is not in scripture, so it's okay. It's like the yeah, Ten Commandments not, neither of them to, is heretical for numbering right, them differently. But just just those are the sources you ought to read. If you're wanting to get a real, in you know, in depth look at this stuff, that that's the place to go. Um, the other thing I would I would commend to you, and and I don't normally do this, but Concordia Seminary St. Louis has published their Systematics Two course online for free. Oh, so you can listen to Dr. Joel Beerman. I was say, is that Beerman? Yeah, yeah, and he does an excellent job of reviewing the heresies of the early church. And how Lutherans talk about Christology. It's it's well worth your listen. Cool. Um, so check that out, and maybe next time we'll try to get some specific links or. I'll see if I can find yeah. the links to that. And I have it saved it in our somewhere. Show I can, notes here. I can put yeah. it on there for you. It's, um, it's so we'll try to figure that out. iTunes U, right? It used to be. They don't do iTunes U anymore. So now oh. they've moved to a podcast format, but it's hard to find. I have to dig. Okay. Yeah, so we'll we'll try to find it for you all. Yeah. But let's get to it. So when you talk about Christology. Um, and this isn't a personal opinion. This is just kind of reality. You want to go to the Gospel of John. Cause I'm pretty sure that's a personal opinion, Kevin. This is why John is a favorite book. Because the two references I gave you weren't in the Gospel of John. You're wrong. And one was actually Paul. Yeah, we'll go to Paul. Wait, they also. were both Paul. Both. But, <laughs> but the reason is, is because the Gospel of John, and this is this is an opinion that's shared by scholars who both believe in Christ and don't believe in Christ, they, they say that the author of the Gospel of John truly believed in the divinity of Jesus. 
that the Gospel of John was written to teach that Jesus was God. Yeah. E- even if people don't like that fact or don't believe that it's true, scholars still say, yes, the, if you're honest about the Gospel of John, yeah. the author believed that Jesus was like, God. E- even your, if, it, if it's somebody from the more liberal, right. historical, critical... You know, this isn't God's word. Right. This wasn't written by the actual Apostle John. All that. You know, none of that. But that person will still say, but whoever did write it yep. did actually believe that Jesus was God. and was, Or at least was trying to teach others yeah. that. So, yeah. So why do they say that? And and the and the reason is because it starts off that way. I mean, the first, <laughs> first couple of verses, you're like, um, oh, there it is. Yeah. So John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word... Okay, and, and just since we start off with Christology, the word there is logos, mm-hmm. so that the ology of Christology is actually the word logos, which is what is here as word, okay? So in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, so we got God and the word as two separate things, Yep. right? And then also the next phrase gets you, and the <laughs> word was God. <laughs> Those so two now, separate things are now actually yeah, the same so thing. so now we have... God and the Word differentiated and then equated. Yeah. So in some way, shape, or form, the author of this writing believes that the Word is divine. Right? Yep. You can see that right away. Yep. So then you kind of cruise on down, and you get to John 1, 14, and it says, and the Word, now in parentheses in your mind saying, who is God, mm-hmm. right? The Word, who is God, became flesh. Oh boy! Incarnated. Would That's be a the big incarnation. Word for that. Yeah. So, so now all of a sudden we have is a divine human, <laughs> and and while that might not sound strange to us because we're used to talking about God this way, we're used to talking about the person of Jesus as one person with two natures. This is striking. Yeah. To say that God became flesh. That's that's striking. This this is a foreign concept. This this will you make will. you stop this, this and new. say, "Are you out of your mind?" <laughs> so um, he dwelt among us, which is reinforcing many ideas from the Old Testament, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father. Okay, so now we have these two persons, God and Word, given names: Father and Son. Right? That's pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. And this word in flesh is full of grace and truth, which if you know your Old Testament, those are words that remind you how Yahweh describes himself. Yeah. So this are, as, as you would say kind of colloquially, these are highfalutin claims, <laughs> right? I mean, what are you talking about? This word who is God now has flesh, dwells among us, so now we're like, oh, well, I guess he's a human but he's the son of the father and he's full of grace and truth like Yahweh is. So you got some explaining to do, John. (laughs) And that's exactly what the rest of the gospel does. Yeah. He explains what he means. Yeah. And, and when you read the gospel, what you find out is that not only is Jesus occasionally called God, this is the idea that literally frames the gospel. So, the, the gospel is made up of a prologue and then the main narrative, and there's a little epilogue, okay? Mm-hmm. But if you look at the main narrative of the gospel, it is actually framed by confessions that Jesus is God. So if you look at the beginning of the gospel, it, the, the narrative itself starts in 119. So in 118, we have another statement of Jesus' divinity. So it's kind of the beginning of the narrative or right before the narrative where it says... No one has ever seen God, meaning the Father, but the only God, the monogonase theos, the the one who is uniquely God in the Greek, right? Who is at the Father's side. So again, you have this Father and God (laughs) thing going on, just like in 114 and 11. He has made the Father known. So now we have that humans can't know God, but the one who is himself God and now one is going to explain to us the Father. Mm-hmm. That's what the gospel is going to be about. So we do this. So we read for 20 chapters about this guy who was a man who was God. And at the very end of the gospel in John 20, 28, 
Thomas looks at Jesus, the resurrected Christ, with the wounds of the crucifixion evident, and he says to him, my Lord and my God. Mm. And Jesus does not rebuke him and say, don't call me God, I'm just a man. But instead, he says he's blessed. And all who so believe like Thomas are blessed. So the Gospel of John is clearly, if you see it, so it kind of frames the narrative, right? At the beginning of the narrative, we have Jesus being God. At the end of the narrative, we have Jesus being God. And several places in the middle, Jesus is himself going to say, I am, right? Yep. Which we read as I am Yahweh. And and several of those times, people pick up stones to stone him. Because he's blaspheming. Yeah, right. because they know what he's saying. So, <laughs> so what we have in the Gospel of John is the author is making assertions that Jesus is God in the prologue. We have one of the characters in the narrative saying explicitly that Jesus is God in Thomas. Mm-hmm. And Jesus himself making statements during the Gospel that people that he is speaking to perceive as statements of him claiming to be divine Mm -hmm. or explicitly then Yahweh himself in the flesh. Yeah. So the question is, is John reliable? And this is the point. Now, now listen to this. Okay. This is, this is John verse chapter 20. Okay. The very end of his gospel. Remember 21 is kind of an epilogue. So as he's ending his gospel, he says this. Now, Jesus, this guy who was God in the flesh, did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Now, listen to this. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and Mm. that by believing, you may have life in his name. So what I want you to think about is this. John believed that correct belief about who Jesus is results in eternal life. Yeah. He's not going to lie to you then about who he thinks Jesus really is. He's going to be doing everything he can to tell you this is who Jesus really is. Right. I mean, that's actually what we see in the Gospel of John. And the whole way through it. <laughs> he is saying, this is who Jesus is, believe it. Yeah. And and the point is, eternal life is at stake. Yep. So this isn't something you're going to play with or, or maybe nuance or pl- kind of maybe use hyperbole or exaggeration. You know, I'm, I'm not going to say he's God when he really isn't because yeah. here's the thing, eternal life is at stake. Yeah. And and so what that means is that John, the Gospel of John and other works of John are written from the perspective that Jesus is a human being who is both man and God. And belief in that and what he did for you on the cross and in the empty tomb is how God gives to you eternal life. Or as Wikipedia says it, the person and work of Jesus and that role in salvation. Exactly. So (laughs) what that means is when the Gospel of John makes these claims, we trust them. Mm. Then you add to it as a Christian, we know this is inspired text, and we know that this is God's word to us saying who he himself is for us. Mm -hmm. And we say... Look, this gospel and the text of this gospel proclaims that Jesus is man, Mm -hmm. right? A human being with two natures, divine and human. And this God, man, Jesus died on a cross for the forgiveness of the sins of the whole world and rose again on the third day to give us eternal life. Faith in that person is eternal life. Isn't that great? Yeah. Now, if only the rest (laughs) of the Bible would agree with him. (laughs) See? Oh, wait. And, wait. and so that's exactly what we do is we say, that all sounds great. Yeah. Does Paul agree? Well, guess what? Paul totally agrees. Mm-hmm. Do the other Gospels agree? They absolutely do. And this is how we actually construct our Christology is we start with the text of Scripture itself mm-hmm. and say, what do they teach us about Jesus? We do not start with philosophical categories. We don't start with the philosophy of God and work backwards. No, we ask this simple question. When we read the Scriptures, mm-hmm. what do they teach us about this Jesus? Yeah. What do they teach us about the Son of God? And what we find out is the Gospel of John, it is the best place to start because it's the most explicit. Sure. But when we read the Gospel of John and understand what we just talked about, it helps us 
see it in other places throughout Holy Scripture. And what you find yeah. is all of a sudden from Genesis to Revelation and back again, that Christology is the message of the Bible, that there's one person, his name is Jesus, mm -hmm. and in that person of Jesus are two natures, divine and human. And this is the way that God saves his people. It's the promise from Genesis mm -hmm. all the way through Revelation and back again. And th this is why it's worth spending a year or eternity, probably eternity. on 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 this this particular um, topic. But it, it brings to mind something that I've that I've often thought, which is if all theology is Christology, if all of Scripture points to Christ, if I'm going off somewhere in my theology, if I've come to a wrong conclusion or I'm believing something wrongly, I can probably say with, I don't know, I, I, I'm hedging my bets here because I'm not entirely sure, but I probably messed up something in what I believe about Jesus in his person and his work. And that's where I my initial error is somewhere in there, and that led me off in the wrong direction on whatever the other, right. whatever false doctrine I end up in. Right. I probably messed up on something with Jesus first. And, and what I always <laughs> say with that is, and I, I say it to myself as well, is whenever you have a theological idea crucify it. Yeah. Take it to the cross and nail it there. If what you were thinking is inconsistent with the cross or doesn't work with the cross, then you're wrong. <laughs> if crucifying on the cross only brings you closer to God and closer to Christ and saying, yes, what I always think the scriptures are teaching me is exactly what Christ did on the cross, then you're right. Mm. And that's exactly how Jesus teaches his disciples. Remember, and we're, we'll look at all these passages later, but remember in Luke 24, 44, when Jesus is telling his disciples about the Old Testament, he says, look, the whole thing's written about On me. the road to Emmaus. Yeah. yeah. And, and the whole thing's written about Christ. And, and, it's, and it's in there that the Christ must suffer and die. Mm -hmm. So the whole Old Testament teaches that. Obviously, the whole New Testament teaches that. So that's what we mean, is that this, this discussion of who Jesus is, according to John 118, is really a discussion of how do we know God. Hmm. So we take all of our theology, which are words about God, Right? If, if Christology are words about Christ, theology is words about God, we take all of that and we say, bring us to the cross. Bring us to the empty tomb. Show us how God saved us through his son, Jesus Christ. Teach us how to think correctly. And Christology is, is one of the ways that you really learn a lot about how to speak to your friends and neighbors about who this God is who loves us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for us. And that is the Crucial Conversation we'll be having here on Crucial Conversations for, well, the foreseeable future. So please join us in that, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. <laughs>